Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Welcome to the library of the Institute for Human Sciences for our second in our series of presentations by our Europe's Future Fellows. You will see that we have a few people uh, here in the library with us. Um, Alison Smale is here, one of our fellows who's uh, passing through Vienna. So that's a, a real pleasure to have her. I see in the list uh, that we have others as well. Uh, my name is Ivan Weber. I'm a permanent fellow here at the Institute and uh, I lead the Europe's Futures Project, which is generously funded by the Erste Foundation here uh, in Vienna. It's a three-year project. This is the third year where we have eight fellows. And uh, today we have um, our colleague, Dr. Sajan Tsvic, who is speaking to us uh, from Brussels. Uh, he is a member uh, of the Open Society European Policy Institute. Uh, he was a, a journalist, a former diplomat as well, and has been doing uh, much work on the whole issue that's in part related to enlargement, to the uh, position that European member states have uh, on enlargement uh, and the like. Uh, today, he will speak uh, about uh, the loss of trust uh, and his uh, focus or case study, if you wish, uh, is on Serbia uh, from uh, 10,000, from the year 10,000 to COVID-19. Uh, needless to say, um, for those of you who follow these affairs, uh, we are, uh, since I'm also from, from Serbia and Belgrade, we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of the fall of uh, Slobodan Milosevic's regime, which was uh, two days ago, uh, the 5th uh, of October uh, 2000, when half a million people came into the streets to defend an electoral victory that was obtained on the 24th of September, a memorable moment for all of us who were there. Uh, and uh, really the, 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 the birth of, of, of democracy, and if one can put it in uh, such terms. Obviously the aftermath uh, is somewhat more complicated that, than a great uh, victory for, for freedom and democracy. And that's what uh, Sirjan will be uh, talking to us about. Uh, before I give the, the floor to Sirjan, I must apologize for our late start uh, as sometimes happen. Uh, technology uh, uh, lets you down in the last minute as you're about to launch. So uh, that happened to us today. I hope we will be able to mend that uh, uh, for, for the next time. And um, so uh, as last time, uh, when we had uh, Dmitar Bechev talking to us from North Carolina, we will have a presentation by Sarjan uh, for about 40, uh, 40 minutes. Then we'll open it up to a Q&A and we'll end uh, roughly um, around uh, 3.30 or a few minutes after since we began a bit late. Uh, Sirjan, please uh, take the floor. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, a desire to embark on this research was brewing for a very long time now. And uh, you were mentioning 5th of October. Well, Serbia ceased to be the place of my permanent residence several months after that memorable moment. And since then, when I started uh, my PhD studies at the European University Institute in Florence in 2001, I'm living in between the rest of Europe and Serbia. So my dentist is still in Serbia. My hairdresser, well, was in Serbia. Rest of my family is there. Half of my life is there. However, the, the fact that I did leave, uh, like many of the Serbs in the last two decades, uh, gave me the opportunity to distance myself from the daily events, uh, think and write about them from another perspective, I think. And a lot of the thinking and writing on this topic actually happened while constantly commuting from wherever my place of residence in the rest of Europe was at the moment and Belgrade. So these were the times you have to imagine before the low cost airline, uh, airliners flocked over the skies of Europe, the Eurolines bus, and when I could afford it, a shortened and shabby version of Orient Express that was connecting Venice 
to Belgrade via Zagreb was my commuter train. And back in Serbia, in these early years, a journalist in the making, I lived uh, through most important stages of the first years of its democratization process. Uh, I spent a sleepless night uh, ducked in the bushes in front of Milosevic's villa with other real journalists in the spring of 2001 when the special units of the Serbia state security and police stormed in to arrest him. I was there in the summer of 2001 when the democratic opposition of Serbia disintegrated in, in a vortex of intestine struggles, giving the opportunity actually to the authoritarian deep state to, to an extent, survive, thrive, and argue, arg arguably rule the country until today. I was at the terrace of our socialist high riser, overlooking the beauties of New Belgrade's brutalist architecture, discussing with my father, uh, with my late father, whether he should, pursuant to the May 2001 decree, request access to his dossier, if he had one. He never did, and since 2003, it was no longer possible. It is there that I found an awful secret that our family friends too, like thousands of other parents in Serbia, doubt their daughter, uh, deceased the day after her birth in the 1970s, to be in fact still alive, stolen by a well-organized ring of child traffickers. And I was at the same Eurolines bus in March 2003, trying to sleep, when my mobile phone, the, the size of two fists put together, uh, woke me up to the awful news that someone shot and killed our first democratically elected prime minister since World War II. So the idea to write about Serbia's democratization is not new. And to try to make sense of it, uh, uh, I started thinking about it already while at the European University Institute on the same hills overlooking Florence, which is thought to be much of the setting for Boccaccio's De Camero. Every time I lost the will to write up the last chapters of my dissertation in the field of legal theory and political philosophy, the inspiration to, to start doing this research came to the fore. After all, it was all about the same thing as you mentioned even about trust, trust of citizens in their elected governments as the basic source of state legitimacy. So in parallel to writing my thesis, I spent many days clued to the chair of Vila Skifanoia, collecting documents, newspaper articles, and scribbling a puzzle of paragraphs that were almost two decades later to become a basis for this research. So back then, I would look through the window, gaze over Florence's Duomo, Palazzo Vecchio, hills on the other side of the Arno River, and daydream about somebody giving me a fellowship to write the chronicles of Serbia's democratization. Over the years, um, as you mentioned, everyday work in international diplomacy and Brussels-based think tanks scrutinizing the European Union, its foreign and security policy, and the enlargement process in particular, prevented me from continuing this research. So the materials were put away on several old USB sticks containing chapters of my thesis, other academic publications, journalist articles, and old family photos. So this research had to wait for another 20 years. And thanks to the program Europe's Futures of the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna and the Erste Foundation, it can finally become a reality. So uh, on Monday, as even mentioned two days ago, uh, uh, 20 years ago, the Iron Curtain surrounding Serbia fell with a decade long delay with respect to the rest of the post-communist Europe. And ever since, the, the country has been on a rickety transition towards an established democracy and EU membership. And more than Serbia's inability to settle firmly on the Western geopolitical course, more than a serenity dispute with Kosovo and its uneasy relationship with some of the neighbors. It is the lack of trust between the citizens and the government internally that stood in the way of the construction of a stable democracy in the country. So 
the, the aim of this research really is to focus on the internationally untold stories of Serbia's transition that have at its center the trust as the basis uh, of a social contract between the ruler and the ruled in a democratic polity. So to do this, the study will focus on the example of the democratic transition of Serbia from 5th of October 2000 until the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic experience with important flashbacks to the country's modern history uh, to demonstrate how the inability of the post-authoritarian governments to build the relationship of confidence with the citizens had a detrimental effect on the success of the country's democratization until now. So uh, after almost two decades of work and research and even enlargement, the intention is to use the example of Serbia also to demonstrate how the one size fits all model designed to guide EU's transformational experiment in the countries aspiring to join the union does not match the needs and expectations of their citizens. In this way, the example of Serbia can also serve as an analogy for all other EU member states or candidate countries that have emerged from the post-World War II communist experience. So in my research, I'll be focusing on the four stories and we'll show how Serbia's democracy until now failed to answer to the four basic questions emerging from these four examples. Without answering to these questions, it is very difficult to leave the dark legacy of the former authoritarian regimes behind. So first question is how and why did they lie to us? Trying to put Serbia's government hopeless mismanagement of the coronavirus pandemic in a historical perspective. The second is who spied on us? I wrote about it on the Europe Futures website uh, two days ago. This one is tackling the issue of still closed secret police dossiers. The third question is, was there a political conspiracy to kill our prime minister? And did the conspirators try to creep kill our democracy in the process? And finally, the fourth question is, did they steal our children? And will the parents ever find out? This one is on the, on the affair of the missing babies. The failure to provide justice and accountability in these cases and shed the light on the following stories is really, a, if you want, a litmus test for evaluating the success of Serbia's democratization until now. But the first story is the most recent on the Serbian lessons from the coronavirus pandemic. It's probably also too, too early to draw conclusions uh, at this point, but before, let me first go back further into history. Uh, returning from the first official trip to Istanbul, Serbian Prince Mikhailo Brenovic voluntarily spent five days in a quarantine just across the border from the Ottoman Empire in the east of Serbia. The purpose of his uh, self-isolation, if you want, was to check the young prince's health in order to protect the population of Serbia from a possible illness the ruler may bring back to the country. This was 1840 and Prince Mikhail was one of Europe's enlightened absolute monarchs. So now fast forward to 2020. And a disclaimer, all the governments made mistakes during the coronavirus pandemic. Serbia's one is not the only one, but the mismanagement of the crisis in Serbia stands in contrast, not only with the European average of today, but in a purely cultural sense, if you want, also with Serbia, I just mentioned 180 years ago, in, in, in a situation where it should be precisely the opposite, irresponsible politics triumph over science. From an initial clownish uh, downplaying of the seriousness of the virus, through a belated brutal lockdown of the entire country lasting from 15th of March to 6th of May and a premature announcement of the victory over the virus, the regime in Serbia has ticked all the boxes of utterly incompetent populism. The Balkans investigative reporting network has managed to prove that the Serbian government consistently underreported coronavirus infections 
and deaths in order to justify the hasty reopening of the country in the service of the holding of the parliamentary elections in June this year. And uh, in a hopelessly unfair vote, the ruling party won more than two thirds of the seats in the new parliament. A large part of the opposition, as some of you may know, boycotted the elections and those that did not fail to win any seats. So similar to the period of one party rule, the parliament now is filled with representatives of the governing coalition, their alkalites and a few minority representatives. In a recent conversation with uh, Boris Marte from the Erste Foundation, Ivan Krastev described the impotence of the authoritarian rulers in the face of the coronavirus pandemic and underlined that in order to manage the crisis properly, no amount of power can replace social trust. You can find the conversation on the Europe's Futures website. And in, in present day Serbia, the popular trust in government is inversely proportional to the regime's political power that I just described. The unnecessarily brutal repression of the protests the uh, against the government mismanagement of the coronavirus pandemic in July was a manifestation of the regime's fragility, not its strength. So throughout modern history of Serbia, it is uh, indeed difficult to find an example of incompetence that would match the mismanagement of the coronavirus pandemic by today's government. And uh, 1972 comes to mind. When everyone thought that variola, a more deadly version of smallpox, to be eradicated in Europe, the disease reappeared in communist Yugoslavia. A pilgrim to Mecca brought it back to the country and infected 184 people in Kosovo and Serbia, out of which 40 died. Uh, in a rare book on the topic published on the 40th anniversary of the epidemic in 2012, Nikola Bura, a Serbian physician, offers a de detailed description of the government's respo response to um, this deadly vi virus outbreak. Unfortunately, the book is only available in Serbian, so not in English. Uh, politics, what you can see from this example of 1972 is that politics often presents an obstacle to scientific efficiency. 72 in some ways was no different than 2020. The communist leadership initially resisted acknowledging the variola epidemic from fear of economic consequences mainly, but also political. And with three days delay, the public find, found out that the variola virus had actually reached the largest city in the country, Belgrade. However, the overall regime's response to the variola outbreak was remarkably efficient. In 10 days, with virtually no opposition, the variola vaccine was administered to all 1.2 million inhabitants of Belgrade. So think about that, 10 days, 1.2 million. And a number of hard quarantines were established across Serbia and Yugoslavia. So long orderly lines of citizens patiently waiting to be vaccinated, now placed in juxtaposition to the delirious protests of the no vaxxers and other conspiracy theories in 2020, tell much more about the legitimacy of both political systems than the, about the people that lived in them. Looking back at 1972, a remarkable level of trust of the citizens in an essentially authoritarian communist system is striking. The, the hybrid regimes in Hungary, Serbia today are unlike the communist Yugoslavia, technically speaking democracies. They have multi-party elections, they're free but not fair because, because incumbents use all available state resources to stay in power. But as the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed, the competitive authoritarian systems managed to combine all the weaknesses of democracies and negative characteristics of, of organized dictatorship. During the pandemic, they proved to be the worst of the two worlds, really. Hybrid regimes are fragile, inefficient, and slaves to the public opinion like democracies. On the other hand, like the authoritarian regimes, they are intolerant to dissent, excessively vindicative 
and cruel. Uh, the second story uh, is about the opening of the secret dossiers of the authoritarian regime. And I think here is the link, because to truly understand Serbia's democratization, one needs to comprehend the nature of his democratic revolution in October 2000. The overwhelming belief in the coalition that defeated Milosevic was that the price to pay for a bloodless revolution was to leave some of the Milosevic key uh, security apparatus figures in power. And this decision had significant consequences of the, on the, let's say, democratization process in the following years. On the morning of 7th of October 2000, uh, exactly 20 years ago on this day, while most of the country, including myself, celebrated our long-awaited freedom, uh, the shredders and furnaces of Milosevic's political police began working around the clock to destroy all evidence of the atrocities committed by the regime. The intention of the dictator spies was not only to protect the dark secrets of the regime, but also to retain these files and use them as a tool to blackmail a succession of new democratic governments. In May 2001, the new democratic government, as I mentioned in, in the introduction, adopted the decree on the declassification of all citizens' records kept by the state security service of the old regime. And already several months before that, in February 2001, the public prosecutor brought charges against Radomir Markovic, state security head, and several of Milosevic's top agents for illegally duplicating CDs containing the dossiers of the opposition leaders. So paradoxically, the May decree decriminalized their actions and thus removed legal grounds upon which prosecutors could lawfully hold Markovic and others accountable. The democratic government uh, knew of Markovic's involvement in the political murders. He was later sentenced, but they did not have at that point the proof for it. So the burning of the dossiers uh, was used to keep him and his collaborators in jail. Declassifying the files meant that burning them was no longer a criminal act, but the mere administrative offense and that they could be released from prison. So the way in which the decree was, clum uh, was adopted was, yes, clumsy and it was amended in less than a week. So a new decree applied. And although the politicians who came to power by doing this, uh, were actually fulfilling their electoral promise to prosecute those involved in the wrongdoings of the of fallen regime, they left it to the Milosevic's former agents to implement the rulings against their colleagues. And this was hardly uh, an efficient strategy for obvious reasons. Uh, disappointingly, unlike the German Stasi records of the 1991, the Serbian decree only allowed citizens to um, consult their dossiers. What did, what, does, what did this mean? It meant that they could not photocopy or reprodu reproduce their content. They could not even do it with a pen and paper, nor they could inform others about the information that they found in their dossier, I mean, publicly. So divulging the content of the documents to others publicly would technically constitute a crime. So what was intended as a regulation aimed to open the files of the communist poli uh, secret police, de facto served as an instrument to close them and possibly forever. So from May 2001 until June 2003, when the constitutional court judged the decree unconstitutional, the figure that of people, the number of people that asked, asked access to their dossiers was appro approximately 8,000. Out of these, only 420 people managed actually to see their dossiers. And uh, from their experience, we know that most dossiers were heavily redacted and that they almost exclusively refer to the period prior to Milosevic's rule. So now, in, just in comparison, during the same period, more than uh, in early 1990s, uh, more than a million former East Germans had applied to see their files. Of these, uh, 
uh, approximately 420,000 read their files and uh, roughly 360,000 had learned but with relief or some with disappointment that no file on them could be found. So the, despite the fact that the East German population at the time was twice the size of Serbia's, the disproportionately smaller number of requests in Serbia is striking. The Gauk authority in Germany had found thousand times more files on its, peop on its people than the authorities in Serbia did. So uh, 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 only five out of a hundred who requested their files got the chance to see them in Serbia. In Germany, that figure is closer to 40%. So the Serbian population's lack of enthusiasm for the process is perfectly understandable. Not only were the exact same people who spied on them now deciding whether to release their files, but those who actually managed to access their dossiers uh, were, were barred from publicly sharing any of the information found in them. An absurd situation, to say the least. So despite the fact that some tried later to promote the regulated opening of the security services secret files along the lines of Germany or other former communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe that joined the EU, Serbia is yet to adopt a systemic law regulating access to the dossiers of the pre-2000 era. So far from lustrating the people who spied on their own citizens during Serbia's authoritarian phase, an embarrassingly small number of them was sentenced for the crimes they committed. So only two people from Milosevic's state security service ended up in prison for the political crimes committed during the 1990s. True enough, the state security's head in the last two years of the dictatorship, Radomir Markovic is one of the two. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison. And another high ranking a agent, the second one for a short prison sentence. But the rest of them are not only living their lives in impunity in Serbia today, but they continue to hold the reins of power in the country until this day. So the third story is about the murder of the of our late prime minister. The assassination of Serbia's prime minister Zoran Djindjic on 12th of March, 2003, more than any other event in the last two decades had a detrimental effect on the country's democratization. But yet further we are from that day, the more blurry is the understanding of the background and the historical processes that led to the attempted creep killing of Serbia's democracy. So now leaving aside the most outlandish conspiracy theories, and there are some, several essentially false readings of the murder dominate the public discourse. So, so many think that they killed Zoran Djindjic because of his determination to extradite suspected war criminals to the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague. Others that he was assassinated because of his willingness to finally cut the Kosovo North. However, like during the Yugoslav fratricidal wars of the 1990s, if you want, tribal nationalism was not the main cause, but means used to rally the masses behind the criminal enterprise. Djindjic was assassinated because he was about to strike a mortal blow to one of the most powerful criminal syndicates in the country. The people who murdered him acted in order to avoid going to prison. And he was killed in a, if you think about it, in a conspiracy concocted by a band of thugs from Serbia's underworld and rogue members of the country's security establishment. In Serbia, the, the story of the murder of uh, Djindjic is sometimes compared to the assassination of uh, jo John F. Kennedy. However, Apart from the fact that both were killed from a sniper rifle, nothing else is comparable. A veil of mystery wrapped around Kennedy's assassination allows for the, for the mushrooming of hundreds of conspiracy theories. On the other hand, a widely publicized and scrutinized trial has made it possible to shed an almost full light on who, why, and how assassinated the first democratic prime minister of Serbia.
However, many shrug off the possibility that, the possibility that gangsters alone dare to strike at the very heart of the Serbian government. They think that in order to master the courage to commit such an act, the criminals must have had a political backing and that these backers gave them a more or less explicit wing to carry on with the operation. On the 12th of December, 2011, the late mother and sister of the prime minister filed a private complaint against Jinjit Salai and a deputy prime minister in his government and another disgruntled member of the ruling coalition for failure to report a crime. Additionally, several collaborating witnesses in the trial for the murder of the prime minister stated that the deputy prime minister that I mentioned knew of the plans to kill Jinjic and that he was supposed to take the prime minister's place after the murder. The public prosecutor never pressed charges uh, against the two, presumably for the lack of evidence. Now, Lucius Cassius, one of the most revered uh, Roman judges, formulated the question, cui bono, uh, who benefits, as one of the leading principles of the criminal investigation. The deputy prime minister became an acting prime minister after Gingis' murder, but lasted in the position for only four days. On the other hand, the assassination led to the weakening of the Gingis Democratic Party. And at the end of the same year, his main rival, Vojislav Kustunica, elect, was elected to head the Serbian government from 2004 for the next four years. And Kustunica's party led the vilest campaigns against Gingis prior to his assassination. And several of the former Yugoslav president's close co collaborators had contacts with the main conspirators in the prime minister's murder. They were briefly arrested during the state of emergency that followed Gingis' assassination, but were later released uh, as well, presumably for the lack of evidence to start criminal prosecution. So like in the case of the private complaint for, from Gingis' family, they were never charged. Now the question is, was the assassination possible without an elaborate political conspiracy? The short answer is probably yes. The longer one I'm going to give you now. In a masterpiece book on the 23rd of February, 1981, attempted coup d'etat in Spain, uh, entitled The Anatomy of the Moment. And there is an English and Croatian translation that I'm aware of for those who do not read Spanish. Javier Cercas describes multiple, in many cases, entirely uncoordinated actions by, by various political actors that have made the botched Spanish coup possible. And Cercas calls these uh, political operations, and I quote, a placenta that feeds the coup. Similarly, in the case of Gingit's assassination, without directly participating in the conspiracy to kill, a messy web of uncoordinated, uncoordinated political maneuvers by different interest groups willing to destabilize the prime minister's government for various reasons presented the fertile ground on which the conspirators fed. Yet this still does not explain how common criminals could dare to murder the prime minister. In order to understand this, uh, one has to go back to the late 1970s and, April, and 1980s. During the Yugoslav, uh, during the European years of lead, right up to the fall of the Berlin Wall, when terrorist violence was a common means of resolving political disputes on our continent, the secret service of communist Yugoslavia practiced its own version of state terrorism. In order to neutralize the political immigration opposed to Tito's regime, it started contracting common criminals from Yugoslavia for the assassinations abroad. The state targeted, yes, terrorists, but also intellectuals whose critical writing it feared. In 2016, the Belgian court convicted the former Yugoslav secret agents and two Yugoslav criminals to life in prison for a 1990 murder of a Kosovo human rights activist. This was, uh, there is still an appeal process ongoing on this case. But the same year, 
a German court sentenced to life in prison two, two top Yugoslavia Croatian secret police agents for a 1983 murder of a Croatian emigre in Germany. The Croatian state's attitude to this case presented an important hurdle before crossing the finishing line of EU membership with the country. So these two assassinations are just a top of an iceberg leaving below a mountain of cadavers of the likely victims of the communist Yugoslavia's political police. So in exchange for the services offered to the communist regime, the gangsters got logistical support to engage in crime in Western Europe and enjoyed life in Yugoslavia in total impunity almost. In the course of a decade of the 1970s and 1980s, because of this relationship, the Yugoslav security apparatus slowly criminalized. And then came the 1990s, wars and the rogue capitalism of the post-communist Yugoslav type. The relationship between organized crime and their former masters from the security services became, if you want, more balanced. Former thugs, empowered by the earnings from the war lootings, drug trade and criminal privatizations, joined the mainstream of Yugoslav social and political life. So the dividing line between the state and crime completely blurred. Like the assassins of the prime minister Djindic, all criminals started to believe that they were more powerful than the state itself. This is how it was possible. Considering Milosevic in the 1990s as the source of all evils is a common mistake in the interpretation of contemporary history of the Yugoslav lands. Milosevic's rule and the blood, bloody Yugoslav wars mark the end of an incubation period where the symptoms of an infectious disease became apparent. The virus of criminal authoritarianism was present in Serbia and most of the region as at least since the formation of the first modern states. Communism, nationalism, and the corrupt capitalism of the last 30 years are just the most recent manifestations, mutations of the same virus. And Serbia and the entire region is awaiting for the vaccine, hoping EU membership of their countries may be a solution. Now, the last story, seemingly apolitical, is in some ways the most unknown abroad. It is about the city of lost children. On 26th of March, 2013, the European Court for Human Rights ruled against Serbia in the case of Zorica Jovanovic. The court in Strasbourg uh, concluded that Serbia violated the plaintiff's right to private and family life. Now, who is Zorica Jovanovic? In 1983, she gave a birth to a perfectly healthy baby boy. Some days later, instead of discharging the mother and the baby as announced, the physician on duty informed Jovanovic that her son had died during the night. The rest is a tale of um, remarkable inhumanity, egregious bureaucratic neglect, and possibly worse, baby theft. So to this day, Jovanovic and her husband do not know where, and if at all, the medical authorities buried their son. Following a common practice at the time, especially in the case of young parents of humble means, but not only, the paternal estate would offer to take care of the burial of the deceased newborns. Much later, in this particular case, the hospital informed Jovanovic that her baby had died due to an unknown cause and that the municipality confirmed that the death of the baby was never registered. The parents also received their son's birth certificate, as well as the hospital's request for the registration of birth filed back then in 1983. So this raised obviously the doubts that somebody stole their son, that their son is still alive. And this is not an isolated example. First cases of the so-called missing children date back to the 1950s. According to the estimates from a book entitled in Serbian Board to Disappear by late Misha Ristovic, a journalist from south of Serbia, families all over the country are convinced that more than 3,000 of their children did not die as they were told. They believe that the ba their babies were stolen 
that many of them are living their lives unaware of their true identity. So the, the, these bereaved people believe that organized group, many of them, the medical staff, uh, the maternity wards, or the municipal clerks, stole their newborns and gave them to others for illegal adoption. So if you would put in one place, just imagine siblings and their families, living grandparents and other close relatives of the missing children, of 3,000 maybe missing children, only Belgrade and a handful of agglomerations in Serbia would be bigger than this enormous city of lost children. So the mass movement for truth and the, the activism of the parents started only after the demise of the dictatorship in October 2020 years ago. For decades earlier, the issue has been a taboo. So what emerged from the parents' initial inquiries is an embarrassing model. Numerous medical records went missing and many of those available had um, incomplete or contradictory information. And uh, bookkeeping mess is probably the most innocuous discovery in the affair. Uh, I was thinking whether to tell you this, but I will because it's necessary for the understanding, but the disorderly disposal of the hospital waste is far worse. And here I offer a content warning for the following 30 seconds. I will describe scenes that some of you may find disturbing. So the staff of the hospitals would allegedly try all the bodies of the deceased newborns in the same plastic bags with the syringes, severe limbs, and bodily parts ablated during the surgery. There are also uh, rumors that they burned these babies. So prior to the activism of the parents in the early 2000s, the cemeteries would not open the bags carrying the corpses of the deceased babies, nor check the documents company them. Now this is no longer possible. But this meant that the hospitals could use the bags carrying the dead bodies also to get rid of medical trash and other ways. In any case, in any whatever happened, the theoretical possibility that one could manipulate the content of the bags created fertile grounds for doubts that the babies may still be alive, in fact. So in 2003, in reaction to the mounting public pressure, criminal investigations in numerous cases of the missing babies started, but led to nowhere. At the beginning of 2005, consternated parents turned towards the politicians for help. And a succession of governments pro promised that they would finally resolve the affair. However, despite the investigative, investigative committee of the parliament in its report, another working group of the parliament, as well as the report of the National Ombudsman. There were no results, really. The state concluded what the parents had already known, so that either the bodies of the missing baby disappeared somewhere on the way towards the cemeteries, or that they were still alive. Then came the 2013 uh, European Court of Human Rights judgment, in the case of Mrs. Jovanovic, obliging the Serbian government to pay non-pecuniary damages to the plaintiff. But more importantly, the sentence had broader consequences as it ordered Serbia to take all appropriate measures to secure the establishment of a mechanism aimed at providing an individual redress to all parents that found themselves in a similar situation to that of Mrs. Jovanovic. So it, in response to the ruling, the government prepared a draft law, but the Council of Europe deemed it inadequate. The government's ambition was clearly only to feel, fulfill its formal obligation at that point from the ECHR's judgment. So for five years after the ruling, the draft law was neither improved nor submitted to a vote and the modeling through continued until early this year. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in February, 2020, the government submitted to the parliament the draft law in fact, very similar to previous versions. And the associations of parents were furious. After initial snubbing of the parents, the prime minister quite unexpectedly reached back asking for their help in submitting the amendments to improve the draft law in the parliamentary procedure. Of course, you know that in case of non-compliance with the ruling of the court in Stra Strasbourg, the 
Council of Europe can even theoretically strip the country of, from its voting rights, also exclude the country from the organization, but there is a panoply of softer diplomatic measures that could be apply, applied against the non-compliant country. So the last minute willingness to cooperate with the association of parents, I believe came from a desire of the government to avoid possible international ostracism in an electoral year. So an, an improvement in the final version of the draft law adopted on 3rd of March, 2020, was the creation of a commission with powers to request information and determine the facts concerning the status of the new, newborn suspected to be missing. So now, whereas it is still early to evaluate the efficiency of this commission, in some ways, Serbian democracy has already suffered a serious blow. Why did it take 20 years to do so? The story of the missing babies is a symbol of Serbia's wobbly democratization post 2000. It confirms not only that the local political elite is completely aloof from the rest of the population, but that the entire democratization process is by and large externally driven. Local constituency for change is small and it rapidly diminishing because of immigration. So whatever the fate of some of the missing babies may be, a 20 year long inability of the democratic state to provide an appropriate answer to the parents' demands has contributed to a dramatic erosion of trust in the government and its administration. So to conclude, uh, in 1989, Janusz Kish, Adam Michnik and Timothy Gartenash wrote, and I quote, in Poland and Hungary today, Europe has an unprecedented chance. It is the chance of transforming communism into liberal democracy. No one has ever done it before. No one knows it can be done. More than 30 years on, we learned that the transformation is indeed possible, also in Serbia, but we are also learning that liberal democracies can backslide and morph into a new kind of authoritarianism. The lack of accountability in all of the four above mentioned cases has created a reservoir of disgruntled citizens disappointed in the newly acquired democracy, thus transforming them in an easy prey to anti democratic populist marauders. More than the world economic crisis in 2008, 2009, it is this lack of transparency and accountability of a succession of previous governments that serves as winds in the sails of the new authoritarian regimes in Hungary, Poland, in this particular case, Serbia, and elsewhere in the communist bloc, post-communist bloc. More than the EU's tactical decision to favor stability to democracy in the Western Balkans, the inability of the EU to address such topics heads on through the accession process has almost entirely disso dissociated the issue of EU membership from a particular country's democratization process. And now something personal for the end. Uh, I would probably never come back to this research had I not gone with my family to watch a 2017 Disney cartoon, Coco. I don't know if you saw it. Inspired by the Mexican holiday of the dead, the film brought us to a parallel world where the deceased, albeit in a skeletal form, continue living their lives, but they're not eternal. Their afterlife can also come to an abrupt end if they're forgotten by all of their living relatives. So in the tear jerking finale of the cartoon, the main character, a little boy, sings a song, Remember Me, to his senile grandmother, trying to awake the memory of her father in order to save him from the permanent death and eternal oblivion. So struggling to contain my own tears, I turned to, towards my seven-year-old daughter, who's desperate crying, uh, I learned from her older sister and mother, had accompanied the last hour of the film, at least. So invoking the Swahili saying, calling the deceased who remain alive in people's memory, the living dead, Maria Todoro, a Bulgarian historian, ventures into estimating that the process of forgetting the ancestors 
starts roughly at the third generation, after which it is, and I quote, accelerated until it reaches obscurity. So wanting my multinational polyglot European daughters and their generation of Serbs living abroad, but also the new generations in Serbia born in the late 1990s and after 2000 who do not have personal recollection of the 1990s to remember and truly understand the country of their fathers, but also Europe and the world in which they're growing up, hoping that um, our grandchildren will remember us and our deeds and misdeeds, and at least for a while save us from eternal oblivion is a powerful driving force behind this research. So as much as the generous support from the Europe's Futures Fellowship, my daughter's tears are the ink on the pages of this research. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sarjan. Thank you for bringing in the personal notes at, at the beginning uh, and at the end. Uh, this is uh, about uh, our fate uh, on this planet, uh, in Europe, uh, in our individual countries, and of course the different paths that our lives have taken due to the disruptions that have occurred. Uh, of course, the fall of the wall uh, in Berlin, the end of communism symbolizing one of those great uh, changing uh, points. Of course, the virus and COVID uh, being another one. And so you're sort of uh, uh, bridging uh, those uh, different timelines and of course the, the events that, that took part. Um, if, if I may add uh, myself a personal note at the beginning before we open it up for a question, it is that the brief period that I was the senior foreign policy advisor to Prime Minister Jinjic in 2002 and 2003, uh, what came to mind when friends asked, so what is it like uh, in government? Well, I said, look, I've, I've, I've lived it, having lived in, in Yugoslavia and what happened. Uh, I'm a political scientist and theorist, so I know the literature on what's happened to democracies in the past two centuries from the French Revolution onwards. And of course, what came to mind was, was Klaus Sofe, our colleague and permanent fellow here at the Institute Professor of Sociology in, in Germany and Berlin, was his, his, uh, his uh, thesis about what he called the simultaneity problem. Uh, in uh, the countries of post-communism and, and what we call democratic transition. Uh, explained very simply, it's the fact that all of these governments from the Baltics down to Bulgaria and backwards have had to address uh, all uh, aspects of, of change from the judici judiciary, state, secret services, health, education, every aspect of life, of course, uh, from a command economy to, to a privatized economy, which was not the case in, in the famous transitions that our friend and colleague Philippe Schmitter and his colleagues studied in, in their famous study on transition because the countries of Southern Europe, Spain, Greece, and Portugal had capitalist economies. So at least that part was uh, not subject to transition. And in the problem of simultaneity, you, and that was the, the one thing that I learned being uh, in uh, with the prime minister was that you're juggling 20 balls at the same time and some balls will fall to the ground. You, it's impossible to keep them all in the air at the same time, which is not to justify anything wrong that happened uh, on the contrary. And I think your work and your project is one that is going to try and reveal some of the aspects of uh, what, what went wrong and why the trust could not uh, be built uh, uh, sooner. Um, I uh, will uh, refrain and uh, from asking any more uh, questions myself and giving uh, my insights. I will go straight ahead to, to questions. And the first one, and I won't name the, the people who, who, who have asked them. The first one is a kind of counterfactual question. Uh, what if uh, Prime Minister Jinjic had lived on uh, now with, with the hindsight? Uh, what would have happened? Would he have lost the next election? Uh, would he have fallen on the Kosovo problem, which we still haven't solved? Here we are, and you know, God knows how long it's lasted. And as, as a kind of more fundamental uh, sub-question to that one from, from the same person is, what is it that you deem today uh, in terms of what is 
of important values uh, and or institutions, a combination or something else. So please go ahead. I, I don't want to disappoint whoever asked the question. I'm not very much into counterfactual. Just speak up, please. Is there, um, uh, yes, I, I wanted to say I don't want to disappoint whoever asked the question because I'm not a big fan of counterfactual history and predictions. But what I can tell you that had he lived on at least the the, the criminals who murdered him would have been in jail. So, uh, and that, that would already be a very big thing. Uh, uh, and uh, probably some of the, uh, let's say, uh, misdeeds of the previous regime and some others that did not, uh, that aren't discovered to this day, for example, like the murder of um, Churuvia, the journalist, uh, would probably um, have been discovered. But uh, as far as whether the Democratic Party would survive in the next elections, uh, I think all that is less important. Uh, the important thing is that he would be alive and even if he would lose the elections, he would be leading the opposition to that government that came. So uh, uh, I could not venture into other predictions. I mean, and on values and institutions, I didn't understand that part. Can you repeat, please, Ivan? So uh, as a kind of uh, subset to, to those particular questions on the counterfactual, uh, a more general question, uh, given uh, the subject that you're treating, uh, what do you see as, as of key importance? Is it values? Is it institutions? Is it uh, a combination of those? Yes, I, I mean, I, I don't think you can really dissociate uh, the two because uh, the example of the missing babies, for, it, it's a great one in that sense, because uh, you may say that uh, uh, if you look at the previous period, uh, legislation was imperfect. A lot of these things uh, could happen because of that precisely. Um, then later after 2000, it was improved. People could talk about it, but the institutions were and kind of still are there. The prosecutors took these cases into account they decided that um, most of them went, you know, if not all, into prescription. And they reached the statute of limitations. But I think the point is, how could this happen in a country where I grew up? And while I was growing up, obviously, I didn't know about it. But to realize ex post facto, not only that this could happen, but that the parents were afraid to speak up against it. That, that kind of tells you uh, about the nature of uh, about the, the, the nature of the challenge that the government that came to power in 2000, 2000 was facing. They came to power in 2001, to be more precise, after the December parliamentary elections. Thank you. So, John, if I can just add a sentence to that, I think, uh, of course, uh, there was huge hope and uh, huge willingness to move forward. Let's not forget that before Milosevic appeared, while there was still uh, the remnant of Yugoslavia in 1989 uh, after the fall, the then Yugoslav last prime minister, um, Ante Markovic, was negotiating in Brussels for Yugoslavia to be the first to engage the process of uh, integration into Europe, which of course created uh, part of those hopes. Then we went through the decade of, of Milosevic and came out with, with those high hopes. Of course, uh, I would say underestimating the challenges that uh, you talked about as, as elements of that, but simply the, 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 the length of time it takes for institutions to take root through a process of consolidation, to put it simply. Um, uh, there is a, a question here uh, about um, the role uh, of the Serbian Orthodox Church that, that you have mentioned. Do you deem that role in any way relevant to uh, the key issue of the process of democratization? Is its role stronger now? Was it? Or, and maybe if you can take Greece as a comparator in that case of the role of the church. I can't hear you. Yes, sorry. I did not mute myself. I, I'm not sure that I directly mentioned the Orthodox Church, but uh, in any case, uh, its role today is definitely much stronger than it was uh, 
prior to 1990 and even prior to 2000, if you want. Uh, uh, but uh, to what extent did it participate? Uh, did it contribute or make harder some of these uh, processes? It's it's hard to say. I I, um, I would say that uh, if you take the first years of um, of the Prime Minister Jinji's government, there was quite a lot of. Uh, it's about Ivan's uh, metaphor of juggling uh, multiple bulls at the same time. For example, the empowered Serbian Orthodox Church had uh, put an enormous pressure on the government to introduce uh, uh, religious education into schools. And uh, the prime minister did that. And uh, he received uh, uh, a barrage of criticism from the progressive part of the society that normally should have supported him, bearing in mind the challenges that he was facing. Um, you know, I cannot say that I am not amongst the responsible ones in that sense. I was very young at the time, but, uh, you know, we, we were all very enthusiastic about the newly acquired democracy. And I think the, the, uh, we were a bit uh, easy on the on criticism at that point. So in that sense, if you say that church added to some of the difficulties, uh, was not a constructive player most of the time, uh, especially when you uh, think about uh, international obligations and domestic ones, in my humble opinion, that Serbia was facing when it comes to uh, you know, the war crimes and uh, co cooperation with the International Criminal Tribunal. I think uh, there um, a bit more clarity on that side and support of the government would have been useful. But uh, I would say uh, uh, it's uh, probably not the main difficulty and the main obstacle for the democratization process. You know, I at least don't see it like that. You have to think, you know, history and uh, the, the, the values, prevailing values in a society work a bit like a pendulum, you know, if you have one period where you have um, an ex authoritarian and secularist like uh, uh, a layman, well, secular government in power during communism where the church was certainly in a subservient role uh, subjugated to the state authority, uh, then split in two, you have the church abroad, church in the country, then, you know, it was all but natural that once 2000 came that they would try to assert their authority in the society. And, uh, but I don't think that they were certainly not part of the solution, I would say, to the democratization process. Okay, we have a question here uh, from the room. Um, Go ahead. Thank you, Ivan. Um, Sergeant, thank you. That was uh, excellent and really interesting. I am older than you are, and I even remember how we were vaccinated in 72 against smallpox. Uh, I would like to ask you a few questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to ask, you mentioned this... Uh, uh, history of the intelligence services and uh, their connection with crime uh, and criminals. Would you explain a bit more about it and where are we today in that respect? The second question is, do you think that uh, in 2000, considering uh, the role of, uh, uh, of different criminals, considering the circumstances at the time, they were really, uh, there was the ambiance to really introduce democracy. And uh, who would you uh, mention as a person uh, in the opposition at the time or who became part of the government who really truly believed in democracy at the time and spread democratic values? Thank you so much. Go ahead, Sajan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, the, thank you. Interesting questions. Uh, for the for the one on the intelligence services, I presume you um, you mentioned the the fact that the, their links to crime that date back to the 1970s and 80s. Um, now there is a, in Serbia's historiography there is a body of literature on this topic. Um, I can name one book, for example, from a historian named Petr Dragišić, Koreputsa of Yugoslavia who was shooting in Yugoslavia that talks a lot about this. 
because um, certain parts of the of the files uh, of the state institutions, not the secret files, but sometimes also the secret files of the of the seed of the foreign ministries. Uh, uh, intelligence agency can be accessible due to a strange, uh, uh, let's say, destiny that uh, bureaucratic mess uh, gets some papers inserted into a non-classified documentation. So the historians know that uh, that uh, there has been a decision on the highest level of Yugoslav authorities to uh, to apply the aggressive measures against the political immigration. So uh, so this came. By and large, it happened before, but it came by and large after the Operation Phoenix in 1972, when a group of Croatian Nazis, Ustashas, stormed into Yugoslavia. They're also called the Bugojno group, and they were, it took, however, two, three months for the Yugoslav People's Army to come to terms with them, to or liquidate them, or arrest some of them. And it was a big challenge uh, to the states, let's say more image than, uh, than actually power internally. And after that, you have a series of um, very suspicious murders all around Western Europe, Northern America. And, uh, and um, the fact that some of the criminals were actually convicted in court for this in Belgium there is an appeals procedure. It's related to the murder of um, Enver Hadri, a Kosovo human rights activist in 1990. And one secret agent, so it means that you don't only have rumors, you have actually, um, um, uh, let's say judicial facts there. And obviously the Jurekuric case or the Perkuric case, however you want to call it uh, in Germany. So, um, so I think, um, we know a bit about that, but we only uh, scratch the surface. And I think uh, a lot of that relationship, because one of these people that operated uh, on behalf of the Yugoslav Secret Service abroad is, for example, the late Jay Kuražnetvich uh, and one of the famous warlords, criminals, and uh, the fact that people who um, killed uh, the Prime Minister Zinjic were uh, let's say committing a series of um, murders of the on the Belgrade um, criminal underworld scene in 2000, 2002, to precisely to avenge his death uh, shows these links. All these people had their contacts in the secret service. Now, that brings me to your second question. Um, and I think it was slightly different because you were asking uh, who from the politicians in DOS that uh, in the democratic opposition of Serbia that came to power in 2000 and sincerely wanted democracy or if I understood correctly the question. Uh, and I, I wouldn't name them, but I think there was uh, quite a lot of them. Uh, uh, they all had obviously their own understanding of that democracy you know, that may not uh, coincide with, with yours and mine, but uh, uh, I say that uh, in, in a large swath of that very heterogeneous groupation that came to power in 2000, quite unexpectedly even for them, I would say, um, there were a lot of sincere people, but, uh, but the simultaneity problem, I will um, here repeat what Ivan has just said, uh, has been a significant challenge. Uh, and I think, you know, if you would ask me about the single moment apart from 2003, 12th of March, uh, that, uh, that could actually have even prevented 2003 uh, uh, from happening, if you want me to be a bit counterfactual here, is uh, the dismembering of the DOS coalition in August 2001. Uh, I think, you know, uh, the, the, the fact that, that the turf war between the Democratic Party of Serbia and the Democratic Party started and that the coalition was no longer there could already tell us you know that what is going to happen in the following years you know so i think most probably the the, the most devastating um, blow to serbian democracy apart from the murder of the prime minister came in that summer of 2001. okay we have a question from uh, our europe futures uh, fellow who is here alison smale 
Thank you very much. And thank you, Sir John, for really an interesting talk, much of which I had not really become aware of. Um, I think it, what it stirred in me was a bigger look at the role that former Yugoslavia played in people's thinking against communism. And it definitely did have a part to play. And I wonder why it perhaps didn't play so much inside the country. And I'm specifically thinking of the case of Milovan Gilas, because I consider Conversations with Stalin to have been one of the seminal books of the 20th century in that it revealed exactly how communism worked in practice and it was pretty deadly. Um, would you have anything to say about the degree to which that background perhaps should have been part of the considerations as one moved forward trying to first of all oust Milosevic and then reduce the influence of what he had come to espouse? Yeah, yeah, no, an excellent uh, observation really. I think a lot of, I think, difficulty to understand what came in the 1990s also come, comes from, a, let's say, a rather kind of superficial view of the former communist Yugoslavia, you know, because people talk about one common former communist Yugoslavia, you know, they talk about Nesto Izmiju, something in between, you know, in between the two blocks. And I think they're if you think at least chronologically, there are two very different realities uh, when you talk about and think about that state. You have the period uh, up to the late 1950s, the beginning of the 1960s and uh, the, the economic reforms of Kiro Grigorov and the opening up of the country. What, what preceded that period it was a regime that was not so different from uh, the rest of the communist bloc in the Warsaw Pact countries that, well, although there are enormous differences between the countries themselves, but I think how people in the West imagine um, communism to be, well, Yugoslavia was like that prior to that period. And then what came afterwards was different. And we remember that period afterwards, I think, you know, and, uh, and uh, with, with important, uh, let's say, uh, black holes, such as, for example, the, the, some of the ones that I was mentioning. So I think without having this uh, more complex view of what happened before, it's really difficult to fall into the trap of kind of, uh, um, let's say, uh, stereotypical uh, reasoning when it comes to why did Yugoslavia break up? Why is the quality of the uh, you know, post Yugoslav states democracy as it is today and so on. I think it's, uh, you're right to say that uh, truly understanding um, that uh, period is very important. And I agree with you, uh, uh, Conversations with Stalin is probably one of my favorite books that uh, I have underlined so many times that it, it doesn't allow for more underlying, I would say. Um. Let me just add a sentence to, to what you've said. I think you're right to point out that uh, uh, to Alison's question that Yugoslavia definitely was a, a communist country. And I think that was the reason for its downfall. Remember that all three communist federations, Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia uh, disappeared in, in different ways, of course. But uh, yeah. at the same time, Yugoslavia was in the, particularly in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, a kind of beacon of hope. Um, in conversations I was lucky to have with uh, late President Václav Havel or Adam Michnik, they would always start their conversation by saying, you were really the hope for us, that there could be a communist country that was freer than what we were living with free uh, curricula at university, buying foreign newspapers, uh, ability to travel. Uh, and that was, I think, what misled a lot of people thinking that Yugoslavia was, the, if it was different in that way, the famous Yugoslav passport, we could travel everywhere. But what was not different was that the backbone, the skeleton was communist, the monopoly of political power, atomized individuals unable to assemble freely or speak freely. So uh, I, I concur that that is something that's important to look at when we want to understand 
what happened. There's a question on, on, on your fourth uh, big question on, on, the, on the children uh, that were lost. Um, and uh, it's a twofold question. One is, was this only happening in Serbia or in other parts of Yugoslavia, number one? And secondly, was the reason to uh, sell these children to childless families in, in the country or abroad? Yeah, uh, well, uh, first of all, that, that's almost the, the immediate question that when I started looking into this, that many of my friends that didn't know about the case so much, they asked me, did it happen in other Yugoslav republics? And uh, I'm hoping to in investigate that uh, more in depth uh, during this period of my fellowship. But I do know of the cases uh, in Croatia, um, I think even Bosnia, though, but certainly in Croatia, where it was established that uh, uh, that this did happen, but uh, it was not the case, at least in these cases that I came across, it was not the case of child theft, but more of uh, you know, the things that I was mentioning, which is uh, egregious bu bureaucratic neglect and uh, really, you know, and uh, what I wanted to say, because you're in, I I'm, I'm not certain that this really, well, let me put it this way. The cases are heterogeneous in nature, if you talk about 3,000 cases. And I, I'm almost certain that not all babies out of them were stolen, but I'm also fairly certain that some were. So if there was one, this is terrible, but there were likely many more. And uh, you're, well, the likely scenario of this, because you're asking, was it, uh, there is a lot of, a lot of, because uh, now you have even um, the websites of the parents associations. Uh, um, you have different parents associations, uh, some really into conspiracy theories, others, you know, responsibly, let's say, uh, trying to uh, find out about the truth in the cases of their children and more broadly. And uh, if you think about the likely scenario of this crime is, um, you know, leaving, um, space for particularities in each case is uh, it could be described in the following way you know an acquaintance of the parents informs the hospital staff of the preg pregnancy due date so the new parents i mean of the parents of the illegal adoption so when the pre pregnant woman arrives to the hospital another woman is already waiting to take over the baby the mother is informed of the death and uh, while the other couple takes the perfectly healthy baby away. Whether it, there were cases of international adoption, maybe, but uh, it would be much more difficult uh, than to go out of the country with a baby and everything. It would still be possible because uh, if you had uh, municipal clerks on board in this uh, supposed mafia, then everything is possible, you know? And uh, there are, the parents have, let's say, credible suspicion that this was the case. But let me tell you something else. There is also an alternative hypothesis of how could it, for example, happen that there is no death certificate, but yes, a birth certificate, or that uh, there is a death certificate issued the day after the baby's death, and then uh, the birth certificate two weeks later. This is because uh, at the deadline, the legal deadline at the time to de de declare the birth of the baby was 15 days. And uh, the, decline, uh, the deadline to declare the, the death was only three days. So it is possible to imagine that the hospital staff hastily communicated the, you know, the death of the baby, provided one date maybe forgot about it, like in the case that I was mentioning. And then weeks later, because of disorderly medical records of pure neglect, provided a different date for the birth, issued the birth certificate. It doesn't necessarily mean that the baby is alive, but it's also very understandable why parents have the, harbored these doubts so many years afterwards and why uh, it is important to know the truth. Because imagine if, um, the, the, the worst thing here is that initially you had uh, probably only one association of parents or maybe two that were really, as you would imagine, 
an activist uh, civil society organization, you know, uh, cooperating with more professional NGOs on the topic, you know, engaging constructively. Now you have everything. Now um, this uh, this is probably one of the most damaging consequences of the inability to to answer to their pleas so many years afterwards is that this story of the missing babies adds to yet another layer of conspiracy theories like, uh, you know, no vaxxers, 5G, name it. Uh, it. It's became part of that to an extent, you know, and, uh, and it hurts democracy in that respect. And you cannot blame, it. you cannot blame others. You cannot blame circumstances. You have to blame let's say the, the inability of the succession of governments to respond to these challenges. Okay, there's a cluster of questions around uh, who is uh, the main political pro-European, pro-EU force in the country? Is it President Vucic, his government or someone else? And related to that, um, is uh, the president and his government, are they really uh, desire for, of joining the EU or are they just uh, pretending? And of course, in light of, as we mentioned yesterday's uh, EU progress reports, maybe you, we can hear your thoughts on, on that cluster. Well, I think an easier question to answer is uh, who the, is the question whether President Vucic and his party is the main pro-EU political force. So the short question to that is no. Uh, 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 the more difficult question is who is the main pro-European? Uh, I mean, there are many political parties that are pro-European, but just the fact that, that the opposition in Serbia has been annihilated to such an extent that you may not even know about them uh, uh, is also very telling of the state of democracy in the country. But you have a panoply of political parties that are in their program, in their <laughs> where they can express themselves, which is mainly on social networks and, uh, and seldom on uh, the one, only three private television stations in Serbia that does, does not have the national frequency. Uh, you can hear their program and uh, I don't want to name them because uh, there are many, but I would also, and I understand it's a cluster of questions, not only one person asking it. So, because my question in return would be, well, define pro-European to me because uh, what I was trying to actually, uh, uh, what I'm trying to come to through this research is uh, that you can be perfectly pro-European, but in terms of uh, values, not be pro-European uh, for me or for many people in the country, you know, who are asking, for example, to know uh, uh, who, are, who are asking for transparency and accountability and redress in all of these cases and others, you know. So uh, uh, um, what was the other question, sorry? Uh, well, that, uh, well uh, I, I was asking uh, uh, to maybe comment uh, the, the, the progress reports progress. in the light of this uh, question. Yes, exactly. But maybe just let me add uh, kind of maybe a quick thought to this question, who is the main pro-EU force? Maybe society is, is itself the main pro-EU force, but yes. the, the silent majority of societies doesn't find the translation into the yes. political sphere. Yes. No, but I, I, I now remembered your second question. Sorry, it was whether the government is pretending. Uh, I think that that's a too simplistic of an interpretation because, uh, because I'm profoundly convinced that uh, that the silent majority in Serbia is uh, pro-EU, that they support Serbia's accession to EU for different reasons. Uh, but I think the main one being the, the political and economic stability that it offers. And um, the government knows that uh, I think uh, the moment they would declaratively turn away from, from this, political goal, they would lose that uh, silent majority. Maybe not because they would be seen as anti-EU per se in a very simplistic way, but because people will think that, okay, this government does not offer us political and social stability anymore. You know, uh, th this is it. So they would uh, see 
the old uh, radicals in them once again, and uh, they would lose that uh, silent majority. So I think it's more complex than that, but, uh, but I already answered in the first question that um, certainly not the main uh, pro-European driving force, you know, <laughs> that, that, uh, that is a very easy question. Yeah. And since, since we're coming to a close uh, now, maybe if you've been able to take a glance at the, at the European Commission's uh, reports or the executive summaries, uh, a comment yeah. of yours on, on, on that, uh, obviously for the whole Western Balkans, but then Serbia in particular. Yeah, so we were discussing uh, with uh, many of, with many people in the, in the think tank community observing, uh, let's say, and uh, writing about this process, about these reports, and, uh, you know, what would be the most appropriate reaction to it. And uh, I jokingly, I said that in two words, no comment, but I think, uh, I think a more nuanced interpretation and a less humorous one would be to say that yes, indeed, uh, uh, in these reports, uh, you saw a lot of the critical language, a lot of the, you know, individual cases of the abuse uh, of the, um, you know, violations of the, um, the acquis of the rule of law and everything stated and mentioned, uh, uh, unlike in the past, there are differences in between the countries. I think um, the Serbian report has been particularly critical, but, uh, but I think then comes the interpretation because who is going to read these reports? It's going to be me, maybe you who is listening uh, to us now, but uh, the general population is certainly not going to read these reports. They're going to hear about them from the mouth of the commission's officials, from the commissioner himself um, and others. Uh, and, uh, and they're going to hear at least in Serbia, uh, where you don't have media freedom, they're going to hear only what the government wants them to hear. So I think that's the bigger problem. One is uh, how do you politically communicate this? And the second one is uh, how does the European Commission communicate in general in the Balkans? There have been certain improvements in the past year with the European External Action Service and Western Balkans Media Task Force, but it's not enough. It needs to be bolstered to a degree where you need to combat this information that I was mentioning at the local level, you know, where local politicians try to, for example, present these reports as normal business as usual, whereas clearly they're not. And on the other hand, um, you have external disinformation, but that's an entirely another ball game, so that we don't have time to discuss about it right now. Okay, Sajan, so we've, we've sort of touched the tip of the iceberg. You've taken us a bit lower into the iceberg uh, through your four questions. Uh, you've announced the, the uh, pursuit of those questions over the year while you'll be a fellow. So thank you very much. I'm sure there are many other questions, you know, contextualizing uh, Serbia's response to COVID along with other countries. We're seeing blunders in counting just yesterday in the UK, uh, disregarding about 10,000 <laughs> new cases. So um, it, we're, we're clearly, uh, all nation states, in, including uh, uh, Serbia, are uh, being faced with, with this enormous, ch enormous challenge and we're not by far out of the woods. So this, this is something uh, that we're going to follow. But I think that your project uh, as, as a case study is very significant on all of these lines in terms of, you know, where, where are we after uh, as we celebrate 30 years of the fall of the wall and 20 years of the fall of Milosevic. So thank you very much. And I can, uh, happy to announce, of course, next week on Wednesday, same time, hopefully without the technical problems that we have had. And I apologize once again to all of you for that, we will have uh, Alison Smail, uh, who will be addressing the question of, of media in uh, Central and Eastern Europe and, and Southeastern Europe. So uh, tune in next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sajan, and thank you to all who participated.